Hello and good morning. As they said, my name is Jay Prigmore. I am a managing engineer at uh, Exponent. Exponent is a consulting firm that does some proactive work, but also do quite a bit of um, forensic inspections as well and forensic work. And I always like to say that the type of work that we do is a cross between CSI and Mythbusters. So a lot of cool stuff we get to do. So thanks for attending the, the presentation. I'd like to kind of give you guys an idea and some, some guidance on, on what to do when an accident occurs at your facility and also what kind of steps to take and how the process is going to unfold over the, the next day, week, month, or even a year. Without further ado, let's get started. Here's an outline of the presentation today. It basically covers the types of electrical accidents, some background on that, what to do when it occurs, what type of information you need to focus on preserving for the actual root cause analysis or even internal investigations and external investigations. What are some of the investigative steps that are going to under your that are going to undertake? And then also kind of get into the area that many people don't really like to deal with, but lawsuits, litigation, and insurance claims, and kind of the dynamic between your on-site personnel the in-house counsels, in-house attorneys or insurance agents, and also some sort of third, you know, third party experts and both that are retained by your attorneys or the attorneys for your company. And also third party experts that represent other companies that, you know, you would have to work with as well. So the first order of business is to discuss, you know, what is an electrical accident? What kind of types are, what types am I talking about? What constitutes an electrical accident? Many of you are probably pretty familiar with the different types of electrical accidents, but for some of you that may not be, uh, here's, here's a short list. Uh, one of them is an arc flash event. Uh, I did a presentation a few months ago on arc flash calculations, and basically it's a rapid release of electrical energy, kind of like a, uh, a bomb going off in your face from the electrical system. It's very violent. The other ones that you're probably very familiar with is electrical shock event and electrocution event. These two usually get pretty confused, especially in the media, where the term electrocution is used for shock events and vice versa. But basically, electric shock event um, is contact with electricity, but the person is still living, while electrocution basically means death by electricity. Some other, other electrical accidents are, you know, electrical system failure, uh, electrical control failure, and electrical fires. And those three can all be interrelated as well as arc flash and electric shock and electrocution. So they're kind of subsets of each other and they all are, they'll have quite a bit to do with each other as well. So moving on to the investigation side of things, here are some common steps to perform uh, during the investigation. So these are things you should look at. These are things that you know that are, that will be done to help try to preserve the evidence or preserve the knowledge of the information of what's going on so you can determine a root cause uh, much more easily and uh, quick, quicker or quicker too. So the first, uh, the first area I want to break down is basically what kind of to do within the first 24 hours. A uh, lot's going to be going on in the first 24 hours and it's going to be very crazy and hectic. And the information and the steps you take the information you gather and the steps you take within the first 24 hours can be very critical uh, when it comes to either preventing further damage or even trying to find the root cause. Many, some of these equipment can erase or lose memory so that you may never know what actually was going on at the time unless you gather that information within the first 24 hours. For example, some relays have uh, first in, first out. And if there's quite a bit of events that were going on in the system, or you know maybe you if power is lost and you shut down and the batteries die in the battery backup you then lose all the all the data that is recorded and you won't have a chance to get that back so here's a short list of what to do within 24 hours first off site security your number one thing to do is secure the site make sure a no one can, no one else can get injured b the energy is you know under control and it's walled off and roped off and no one is going to access it without, without you know, authority or someone who needs to be there. Next step is to start gathering data. And this means a lot of things. It's not just 
PLC, not just alarms, indicators, flags, relay files, stuff like that, but it's also um, it's also gathering what's the word for it? Um, testimony. It's also gathering you know descriptions and interviewing personnel about what they were doing. So some of the things you want to look at first is the equipment's condition. You know, how does it look? How is it damaged in it? Take photographs. Um, some of the photographs you may take right after the, the site or right after the, the incident uh, can be critical and crucial because it's an outdoor facility and you can't get, you know, experts out there to, for the next day, week, month. Then tough stuff can get moved. People can kick things, you know, all sorts of things can happen. Even the weather can affect it. So basically, if you can, you can take a camera out there and document the site's conditions. Next, if you have to, if you can, or if you have to clean it up because it's causing a hazard, gather the evidence, retain the evidence, put them in Ziploc baggies, section stuff off, lock it up, make sure that no one can you know alter its condition. The ideal scenario would be to leave everything in place and don't touch anything, and then have someone else, you know, some of the experts, some of the investigators come in and look at it in its as failed condition or or post post accident condition nothing has changed but that's not always the case and that can't always be done so i've already mentioned protection system event files like relay files these are some of the the dot cev files or the um the dot com trade files in like your your relays they can also be alarms flags indicators on on your switchboards and your mccs um, and then also in the control the control panels where you have the SCADA system and the PLC data, gathering that information as well. And then one of the things you want to do in the first 24 hours as well is contact your in-house legal team. And they can help guide you and direct you into what steps they want you to take. The next section I broke out kind of into what to do within the first 72 hours. Um, it could be 48, it could be a couple, you know, four days. It just 72 hours was a good number to go with. And I would say that one of the best things you can do is interview personnel, especially if the in the injured is is um, able to and uh, willing to and is not severely injured or in the hospital. Uh, one of the things you want to do is interview personnel. So interview him or them. Also interview anyone else who was around the area. Interview who was ever was involved in the task that was being done whenever the accident occurred. Now, if you hadn't gone the skate, gotten the say SCADA data or PLC PLC data yet. You would want to grab that information. I would prefer not to wait until 72 hours. Well, you would definitely want to grab it within 24 hours. But if for some reason you have longer term memory that holds on to the information, such as relay event files, you can usually grab those later, especially if the equipment is turned off. But if it's a type of equipment that's going to change its status and its indicator flags and its position, you want to grab those that information as soon as possible. Because if it resets after so much time, you're going to lose that information forever, unless you have a photograph showing that it was indicated or it was activated. And then if you haven't taken photographs, it might be a good time to go back and take additional photographs or take your first round of photographs so that you can document the scene. You then want to start beginning to gather such as uh, doc other documentation, such as like work permits, training records, or any sort of other um, company policy documentation to see if the proper electrical safety protocols or other safety protocols will, were followed prior to the accident. So after 72 hours, but within one week, you probably want to conduct pretty much all your, your personnel interviews, get their recollection about what, what happened and um, what they did. You start piecing that together. And then again, you still want to keep the site preserved as best as possible. If you're unable to, you need to document the site because it's critical when it comes to these investigations and root cause investigations. Um, you're likely going to start be getting in contact with say the in-house attorneys or outside counsel regarding um, third party investigations or even first party investigations. You may have started your own internal investigation at this point in time with the in, you know, internal investigation team probably have conversations with them. You're going to want to guard, you will going to want to start gathering design documents such as one line diagrams and relay control diagrams and 
you know, any, any of those type of, type of documents, physical layout, diagrams. Next, you're gonna wanna start gathering like maintenance records. Was the equipment maintained? Was it not maintained? Uh, when was the last time it was maintained? Was there any sort of issues that were going on within the past five years or so that could have assisted in having this accident occur? And then you're gonna wanna start looking into like the interlocks and safeties. And if there were some interlocks and safeties to prevent the accident, why did the accident still occur? And that's gonna be one of your main root cause investigation questions is if there's interlocks and safeties to prevent this event from happening, uh, what happened? What was circumvented? What didn't work? What failed to cause these um, interlocks to not do their job so that the individual was injured? So some longer term items to gather. You know, you're probably going to start writing an incident report. That may also be with the third party investigators or maybe an internal incident report. Uh, you may conduct an internal investigation and you may have an external investigation depending on if a lawsuit is filed at some point in time or an insurance claim is claimed, especially if you, know, you lose a very large piece of equipment and you need to replace it. Um, you will likely begin, begin to work with and assist in the investigation of third party investigators, someone like myself and kind of some things that I do on a daily basis may also work with insurance agents. Uh, so the insurance agents can come in and understand what kind of what happened and see if it's covered. And then you may also uh, be supporting the legal team to gather information and documents the legal team can use to help minimize the risk and exposure to your company. So we kind of already touched some of these items already in the previous section. Basically, this is information preservation. So what do you need to do to prevent, to preserve the information and what type of information do you need to preserve? So while there may be some mechanical aspects that need to be preserved, this is really gonna focus more on the electrical side of things. And one of those things you're gonna want is a one-line diagram of the electrical system at the time of the event. Um, now that may be different from the one-line diagram you have in-house. Maybe your one-line diagram is not updated. Maybe it's you know out of date. Uh, maybe the, the maintenance was going on at the time of the accident and your system was operating in a way that's normally not operated. So you'd want to create that one line. And if you have an existing one line, you might want to modify and write notes on how the system was at the time of the accident for documentation. And make sure you only write factual information. Do not write any opinions or thoughts on what you think caused the accident. It's got to be factual. You also want to document special system conditions such as maintenance or certain transformers or generators or equipment that was out of service that may not have had a direct role in the accident, but may have put the system in a condition to permit the accident to happen or to increase the severity or likelihood of an accident. You're also going to want to document the protection devices, you know, what type of relays, circuit breakers, fuses you have, what their functionality is, what their settings are. Um, and then you're going to want to download and save any sort of event recordings and oscilloscope waveform captures those and metering and SCADA data, that type of stuff. So for protective devices, what kind of stuff are you really looking at? I've touched base on this a little bit today, but you definitely want the relay information. You want the protection settings. You want what type of protection is this circuit protected by? You want to know, was there any disturbances or was there any uh, short circuits in the past year or two years that could have damaged the equipment that could have caused this failure that just kind of lingered over time and then failed catastrophically eventually. You want those relay event files. You also want to know and jot down the status of the breaker, you know, before the accident and then, you know, after the accident. Maybe it changed, maybe it didn't change. And if it didn't change, why? If it didn't trip, why? If it tripped, why did it trip? You want to document those things. Also want to document, you know, any sort of fuse operations. Did you replace the fuse and then it tripped again and then you replace it again and then it tripped again and then you replace it a third time and it tripped and then you stopped? You want to document how many times you replaced the fuses and please do not throw the fuses away. You can actually cut open the fuses and tell 
by the fulcrite inside the fuses or estimate the type of fault current that the fuse conducted to trip the fuse. Um, I used to work for a fuse manufacturer and we used to do that all the time when diagnosing um, fuse failures or fuse operations. And then you also want to know if the contactor switch or any auxiliaries or relays or programmable logic controllers, you know, change state. Next, you'd want to go a little bit more into the control system and not just the relays, but more of the actual SCADA system and the PLC overall system, the hierarchy. So these are the kind of things you want to look at. We've kind of already talked about them. So I just wanted to put them again on the, on the slide and kind of show, but we're talking about indicator lights, uh, activated alarm lights, you know, saved waveform captures, operational history, relay flags, SCADA system recordings, and even sensor information. You also want to document the work performed. What was the task at hand? What were they doing? Why were they doing it? Why could this work not be energized? Was it just an accident where something fell and broke when someone was around? Or was a maintenance person or a subcontractor or a contractor actually on site to do some work? Were the electrical safety program steps bypassed? Or did they fill out an electrical safety permit? Or we you know a work permit? Were the interlocks bypassed? Sometimes when doing testing, you have to bypass it to test the, the negative portion of the alarm or the, the um, say the alarm state alarm. And did they forget to turn them back on or turn it back to normal? Was the, was the person wearing PPE? Was it appropriate PPE? What's the arc flash label say? What kind of PPE were they supposed to wear? And um, was any sensors bypassed? Was there a bad sensor where jumper wires used? Those things are pretty critical in determining what happened. And if it's in a control panel, I can almost guarantee you the third party experts are going to be tracing that control panel um, from every connection inside there to see if anything was jumpered. So now we kind of cover the investigative steps. Next is like, okay, after the investigation done or as the investigation is going, what's the relationship with attorneys, in-house counsel, lawsuits, litigation, and uh, insurance claims. And what's their role, what are they gonna do, and kind of how things are going to move forward until we finally get closure. And closure may not occur for a couple of years. So in litigation and insurance, site preservation is, is very critical. If you, um, especially if there's a possibility of sub subrogation. Subrogation basically means that, you know, someone suing you, and then you sue someone else because and you subrogate against them so that you know any payment you have to make is actually their fault so they make the payment on your behalf, essentially. So if whatever you're sued for and you own the top hierarchy, you would then sue the subcontractor and they would pay you who you would then pay the, 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 the owner or the plaintiff. But site preservation is key. You need to keep it site so everyone can do their own independent investigation without relying on information that was recorded by somebody else that could really have a negative impact on the investigation. It's also very key because you don't want to get, you don't want an allegation out there to be on that you uh, did some spoliation of the evidence. So you, you spoiled the evidence and no one can actually use it. It's not usable. You can't really investigate anymore because you destroyed it, essentially. Again, some of the big things too, electrical system condition at the time of the accident, but in, in litigation and in insurance claims, you will likely require a third party expert for each party involved. So it will likely be the company, be the plaintiffs, whoever's suing. It could be a company. It would also be the company you're employed with. It could be the manufacturer of different components. So each manufacturer of a component in the area would likely be sending a, a separate third party expert to do an investigation. And these investigations are rather slow because everyone's going to be there taking photographs and trying to get their own documentation. It's not a fat, it's not a very quick process. Again, an insurance agent would likely require an appointed expert to do an independent analysis to see if the claim is legitimate or not legitimate. And then one big point I'd like to mention is that this will likely require you or someone in your company to retain all their email history related to this accident and the electrical system 
as documentation um, and proof of kind of what was going on at the time. And then it's also going to be all sorts of other technical information. So if there's one piece of advice I could give to anyone you're out there in the facility is do not write anything down that you don't want to be shown in front of you in court. It's best better to call and pick up the phone or walk over to the person's office and talk to them verbally than it is to write down in your email, oh my God, we have a problem. This is not good. That will make you lose a case and that will make you lose your lose your insurance claim or make you lose the litigation. I've seen it happen before. So the next thing I want to talk about is deposition testimony. If say you were in charge of the individual and you told them what to do, um, you will very well may be the person most knowledgeable and you may very well have to testify or give deposition testimony. But luckily for you, you would be only a fact witness. And the idea of fact witness is just to gather facts. So you would be responsible for answering about the facts of the day and what happened and your, your standard practice, your protocols, what they were doing, why they were there, what happened, just all factual information. Very, no opinions, very little opinions. If you do provide an opinion, it's usually your own opinion and not the company's opinion, unless you're appointed as the company representative to give that opinion. Also expert witnesses such as myself do depositions or get our depositions taken um, to help understand where our opinions come from and what support we relied on in our opinions and really to see if we're missing key critical information in our opinions or if we have the information and we've thoroughly thought about all the possibilities and came out with sound engineering judgment and um, engineering opinions. And another thing that you could also do is actually once trial comes, you can actually testify in a bench on a bench in front of a jury. Um, if it's an arbitration, you would testify in front of the, the tribunal panel. Um, but that can definitely happen in, in an accident case. So third party experts, AKA forensic experts, what are they? Well, many of the forensic experts or third party experts are either retired engineers firemen, anyone who has to do with the technical issue at hand. It also may be you know, licensed engineers who have moved over from manufacturing or construction or any sort of other industry to help provide um, testimony and, and help guide like courts or non-technical people in determining what happened and why. Like I said earlier, the forensic expert is kind of like a mix between, and it's like a detective like an electrical system detective. It's a mix between like CSI and Mythbusters where we get to go in and troubleshoot and try to perform a root cause analysis, which may involve random and unique tests that are forced failure tests to cause equipment to fail in the manner that may replicate or may not replicate the, the accident at hand. And a lot of that testing and analysis and is used and the testing analysis is used for informing the opinion about what actually happened and why it's more likely or why it's confirmed or denied that this, this hypothesis is correct and the other hypothesis is wrong based on the evidence at hand. So the role for a third party expert or a forensic expert is basically to just investigate the accident and determine the root cause and be completely unbiased. Experts, for, forensic experts are supposed to be unbiased and just tell the facts how they are. The facts are the facts and this is how it is. It is what it is. One, one issue with forensic experts is trying to avoid confirmation bias where you have a hypothesis and you really only focus on the evidence that supports the hypothesis, but you neglect the other evidence that's contradictory to that hypothesis you want supported. Now, one thing I do want to mention, though, is that it's not always possible to determine a root cause because there's just not enough information. Either the information was destroyed, it doesn't exist, or it's just gone. 
and you just you just can't get it back. Maybe there was no recordings. Maybe you just you just no one was around. You didn't hear anything. Didn't see anything. Just failed. So you may not be able to determine a single root cause. It may be multiple root causes or multiple hypotheses, or maybe you don't know, and it could be one of ten hypotheses. There's just not enough information to narrow it down. So in, during this investigation, there will likely be experts for each party involved, and each expert will form their own opinions. So how would your relationship be with the expert? Well, first off, there are numerous experts, ones that are retained on behalf of your company, others that are retained on behalf of other companies or even maybe the insurance company. And your relationship with the expert is to just help give, just give them the facts. That's really what it is. Your relationship is not to provide opinions. It is not to try to sway their opinion. It is here are the facts and they're going to form their own opinion. So experts are there to help determine a root cause if possible. Now they may help determine how to prevent a reoccurrence from happening. So in their analysis, you may say, okay, this failed because of X, Y, Z. Well, how do we prevent X, Y, Z? Well, you can prevent X, Y, Z by implementing A, B, C. And that may be another role of the expert. And there's no point of, the third bullet point basically refers to hiding information or not giving all the information. Now you'll want to consult with your, your counsel on this, but, and it may be a business decision, but typically, you know, the information is going to be discovered at some point, whether that's in discovery or whether it's now but at some point it's going to be discovered. And, you know, it's kind of a game to play if you try to hide the information, it's gonna come out. So facts are the facts and you can't change the facts. You should not hide information because it looks bad. It looks very bad, especially in court. If someone calls you out that you hid information, it looks really bad. And then sometimes experts may ask for information that may seem obscure, but because it's obscure, you know, sometimes that information can be extremely critical in determining your root cause. So there may be a couple of requests that just, you kind of scratch your head and you're like, why would they be asking this? Most experts have a reason for why they've asked it before. And maybe because they've seen it before and just wanted to either cross off that this was not it or to maybe even roll in that this was still a possibility. So experts are Sometimes, sometimes have to give testimony, whether that's in deposition or whether that's at a trial on the bench. But experts are challenged here in testimony regarding the basis of their opinion. So typically the another party's counsel will take the deposition of, of your company's expert, retained expert. And they will be trying to figure out where the expert or why the expert formed the opinions they did what kind of bounds that they're bound by, and basically what they did and why, and how they came to their conclusion for their opinion. And they will challenge and present other opinions and try to lead them down lines of questioning to make them seem stupid or unknowledgeable or unreliable. So during the expert testimony, typically the more information you know about the project and the, the, the investigation, typically the stronger your opinion is and the less likely it is going to be challenged and successfully challenged, or even uh, what we call in the in this area, the Daubert challenge, where the testimony is basically stricken from the record because it's not useful and you didn't use sound principles in coming, determining your, your opinions. Also testimony provided deposition is trial, as I said, and um, expert testimony can be extremely critical and can be the key component the final decision of a lawsuit, whether you win or whether you lose the lawsuit. So expert testimony is extremely critical in these cases. But with that, I think that's kind of where I'd like to stop. So if there are any questions, please fill them out in the, in the spreadsheet. Send your questions in, I'd be happy to answer them. If you want to, please feel free to give me a call. I believe my contact information is is available. You can always search for my name on, on in the internet and my profile page pops up. But um, I appreciate everyone's time today. Thanks for coming out and um, have a great weekend. Thanks. Bye.